It's good to have you with me, friends. I'm Joseph. This is the Catacombic Machine. I'm just back from Holland, visiting Utrecht together with Barry Taylor. We had a good time talking about radical theology with our Dutch friends. And for those who, who were there, I hope that you had a good time. It was a pleasure meeting you guys. And my aim is to put something up from there. We'll see whatever audio they send me from Holland and what I can do with it. But hopefully I'll get something that I can, can publish here. This episode will be from the catacomb event in Gothenburg that took place about a month ago where I talked to many people but for the podcast with Ulla Sigurdsson who is my old professor I had him for one course maybe two courses at Gothenburg University and um, he wrote a book called Himmelska Kroppar in Swedish 10 years ago uh, it's now being published in English so Himmelska Kroppar is Heavenly Bodies Incarnation, The Gaze and Embodiment in Christian Theology it's a brick, it's 700 pages, but it's well worth reading it because you get so much from the philosophical take on the body, the Christian take on the body, and he starts out, as you will notice, in Nietzsche's critique of Christianity as being nihilistic, and he critiques Nietzsche for being sweeping, but it's not that Ulla is saying Nietzsche was all wrong, no, he goes into the genealogical element of the Christian notion of the body. So it's a it's a historical take, but it's also a theological take, and he engages with some of the most interesting thinkers out there. So I recommend it. Heavenly Bodies, Incarnation, The Gaze and Embodiment in Christian Theology. It's published by Erdmans. So this is Ulla Sigurdsson from the Catacomb event in Gothenburg 2017. Enjoy. Nietzsche talks about Christianity as nihilistic. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe we can start there. Why is Nietzsche so critical about Christianity? This experience of, of the Christianity of, of his time and his place in, in Germany. Uh, and I think he thought that Christianity was denying everything that was this worldly embodiment uh, society uh, and, and so on and and this is i mean nietzsche's philosophy is sort of a, a return to embodiment in, in some way so that's uh, and and he thought that christianity was part of a platonic tradition that that sort of tried to flee the body um well that's the short answer anyhow what is nihilism? Because maybe that's a term that that is confusing. Because mm -hmm. I think you know some people might think that Nietzsche is a nihilist. Yeah. So he critiques Christianity for being nihilistic, yeah. and then he's also a nihilist himself. Right. Um, I I don't know. I'm not sure whether he calls himself a nihilist, but 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 nihilism would be. Uh, the denial of, of that there is anything of value at all, um, and, and so that, as as in everything, there are varieties of nihilism. Yes. But I think the term was coined by Jacobi, uh, a, a German romanticist, in his debate with with some German idealists. Uh, I, at least I think so, and it comes from the Latin nihil, which means nothingness. Um, so the, this. It, that that Nietzsche is a nihilist uh, it, it is maybe because he is seen as a sort of a relativist and, and so is denying that there are any any set values in, in life. Um, but 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 his critique is the the is of the otherworldliness of of Christianity and the denial of embodiment among other things. Nietzsche accuses Christianity for that that Christianity despises the body, mm -hmm. and you've written a book on the body. Yes. So of course it's a good way into that conversation. At the same time, you say that Nietzsche's critique of Christianity is much too sweeping. 
he doesn't look into the to the sort of nuances of the no. Christian tradition and the complexity of Christian doctrines and teachings throughout the ages. And, and I think Nietzsche was thoroughly aware of that. Yeah. Uh, so the book is not about Nietzsche. No, no. It, it, it's, this, this is the opening line uh, of, of the book, and I thought it sounded good. So <laughs> that, that's actually the main reason I put it there. Yeah. This is, there is um, a short engagement with Nietzsche, but, but Nietzsche also is, gives me one of the clues to how I was going to write this book, because Nietzsche says, um, I don't remember the quote, but he says that you, you can't reduce things to just a concept because they have a history. And, and one of my pieces in this book is that the body has a history and the Christian understanding of embodiment has a history, which means basically that the, there is no Christian understanding of the body per se, because it's, it's, it's historical, so different times have had different emphasizes. So, so, so Nietzsche also gives me a sort of theoretical clue to how to go about in this book. So it's, as, as, as some listeners might not be aware of, it's quite a long book. Uh, <laughs> and and um, one of the reasons is that I wanted to also say something about history and how the history of Christian understanding of embodiment. Yeah. And I think that's important because that critique of, of Christianity that sometimes people might say that there is, there is this sort of essential Christianity. Mm -hmm. And what is the essential Christianity view of the body? Mm -hmm. As if there is this sort of eternal yeah. body that we can judge yeah. our understanding yeah. from. And you're not doing that. No. You're going into the history. Mm -hmm. and, and later today we'll Wait. listen to Pietra, who's also doing a similar work with Foucault, yeah. who and was obviously Nietzsche. Yeah, well, so I'm sort of inspired by Foucault also in this book, but but basically I, I'm not suggesting that Nietzsche was thoroughly wrong when he said that Christianity was nihilistic, but because it it has well been in in some places and at some times. So I, I can't judge his, I mean, the, the Christianity of his time. So so maybe he was wrong about that, or maybe he was right, but but is. There is something to it, but it's, it's not just the whole story. And of course, Nietzsche was well aware of that because he has a very complex relation to Christianity. Yeah, and, and sometimes I think when Nietzsche talks about Christianity, he might be talking of Hegel. Yeah, maybe. But we don't want to make this about Nietzsche because that's, as you say, it's a small part of, of the book. It's the opening, but I think it's an important opening. Yeah. As you said, it's a big book. It's some six, seven hundred pages, mm -hmm. and so I asked you for a few chapters. We're not going to talk about the whole book. That would be very, oh. very difficult <laughs> <laughs> to fit within this the limit of this this podcast. But you have a you have a chapter on the philosophical body. Yeah. And so um, you said that Nietzsche might look at Christianity as a sort of Platonic mm -hmm. kind of religion. Yeah. And so let's start with Plato mm -hmm. and Plato's relationship to the body. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure about the basic Platonic worldview either, because there's this this in 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 modernity. There's always been a lot of different times that has held responsible for the so-called denial of the body, and one one of the candidates of for the denial of embodiment is is Plato and, and Platonism. And, and I think this sort of ac accusatory uh, gesture by modernity is somehow a, a bit too facile. I'm not so sure that Plato denied the body either. There is this saying, there, there's, there's this, there is this standard view of Plato that, um, th that that there are two worlds, this world and the world of ideas and, and and the real world is the world of ideas, where this is just a mere shadow. Well, this world is a mere shadow of the ideas. And I'm not so sure that uh, what Plato wants to say. He, he says in one of his dialogues that he has this famous expression, soma sema, which means the body is a grave. 
because that's where the, the soul or the news uh, uh, gets lost, so to speak. But but I, I mean, I start out with Plato just to say something about him, but, but again, I'm not entirely sure that he was that kind of metaphysical dualist, because there are traits in Plato where he, he sort of thinks of transcendence, not as taking leave of embodied, but, but finding transcendence within the, the, the this world sphere. So, but, but, but of course, I mean, it's, it's, um, I'm not an expert on Plato, uh, but I start, as, as many people do, um, I start the story with, with Plato. I, I think that's a, it's, it's a good start. Alfred North White said, uh, the philosopher said that basically everything in philosophy is just footnotes to Plato. And I think what's important, because I agree with you that there, there is this sort of simplified image of Plato, mm -hmm. two different worlds. I think what's important with Plato is that he introduces a distinction yeah. that philosophy still wrestles with. Mm -hmm. I think we will see that distinction, mm -hmm. although we might not speak of it as different world. You can think of a philosopher that I like very much, Henri Bergson, mm -hmm. who also talks about this distinction. Mm -hmm. But the world of ideas, according to Bergson, is the world we have in our minds. Mm -hmm. And that is a static world, like the Platonic mm -hmm. heaven. But that's not an other world. That's how we are evolutionary developed to to sort of understand the world in static concepts, yes. and that creates a difficulty since there is mobility in the world, and we can't really think that mobility. So that's just to say that there is a distinction introduced by by Plato that becomes important. But maybe you want to comment on that. Well, I I think this if if, if thinking is making distinctions. Yeah. And to be able to to make distinctions, you need to distinguish something from something other. And I think this begins with language, actually. So uh, this this mind body dualism or or, or 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 body body soul dualism that I, I think it's I think it's somehow in, inevitable, uh, even though one can ob obviously solve it in other ways than. Well, Plato did, or Augustine did, or or, or whatever. But but it's it's um it's a philosophical problem that is given with language, I suppose. So it's in a, a unavoidable. But then it has uh, somehow become become a, a, a static dualism, uh, and so I'm not that. I mean, I I don't necessarily think it's a better solution that Bergson did, like saying that the other world is in our minds because that's that isn't really my concern but the, the, it, it is this making distinctions which is also important because one of the one of the other things i i don't want a reduction of the body like in in dualism whether plato had it or not but the other uh, horizon or, or critical horizon is that the the body can't be reduced to Biology, either the, the body is is not just a thing, but embodied embodiedness means being in relation, and that's the uh, that's the interesting part of being embodied, so to speak. Um, and I think I think that kind of a naturalism that is reductionist and reduces the body to something that just is there is is as is as um, facile as as a, as a dualism is. So neither monism uh, nor dualism. Okay, so then you, you write about Aristotle as well, but I think we can pass that and move to Descartes and talk about the modern understanding of the body because that's also, I think, a, a, an understanding that many people would think is quite natural. Yeah, uh, at least if you are born in Sweden, mm -hmm. in the Western world. Well, if if you we have a big encyclopedia in Sweden called Nationalt Encyclopedin. If you look up the, um, the the concept of body in it, it, they introduce they introduce a kind of a mind body or soul body dualism there. So that's I I think you're right. This is a common understanding and. 
and I think it has a lot to do with Descartes, René Descartes, um, who in some of his books, not, not all of them, has this distinction between res extensa, which is uh, the, um, the, extended world. the extended thing, and, and then res um, cogus, thank you, the thinking thing. So, so this, this, is, this is the modern version of the, this dualism. And I think, I think Descartes has been very influential. It, it, I think it's interesting to say that he also wrote um, a, another book at the end of his life called uh, The Passions of the Soul or something like that in, in English, where he says something completely different um, and has more so to speak, phenomenological understanding of embodiment. But, but in, in these, the, the uh, discourse on the method uh, and, and the other book, uh, sorry for forgetting all the titles here, um, he, he introduces this mind-body dualism, that, which I think has been you know, read into Plato and read into Christianity. Okay, so and uh, read into ancient Christianity, I, I, I should say, because I think also it influenced Christian theology enormously, and so 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 we get this this dualism, but it's it's more of a modern in, invention than than anything else. Yeah, and it, I think it comes to sort of define what a dualism is, and that therefore Plato is read through that, yeah, and yeah. our understanding of history is transformed by Descartes not only after him mm -hmm. but also before yeah, him, yeah, right? Yeah. He represents, you say, the modern conception of the body, mm -hmm. uh, and there is a dualism here, yeah. which is quite clear, yes. and so uh, very distinguished. So maybe we can talk about what this dualism implies when it comes to the social body as well. Mm -hmm. It implies many different things, but I think that body to to have a body uh, as a human being is is being implied also in a in, in a social context there there is there is a lot of talk about the body through history and and one of the uses of the concept is the uh, the, the body politic which means sort of the policy of a of a country uh, or, or of a of an institution and and so the the ways of being embodied is also dependent on on the social environment but i think that for instance christianity tends to forget the uh, it, it, it all, all kind of individualism uh, including christian individualism tends to forget how dependent on the social circumstances we really are uh, and and this this is also a, a embodied dependence, not not just nurture in, in the sense that we need. Well, somebody obviously brings us the food. I mean, grows the food. I don't grow food. I I write books. <laughs> uh, but 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 there is also a sense of the concepts and and the images of embodiment are dependent on on a social imagery. So. So being being embodied means being involved in a social context uh, in in many ways, and but there is a forgetfulness of this uh, that that sort of plays out in in not only of course Christianity, modern Christianity, but also modernity or some modernities as such. And, and so when when we say that our Society is individualistic. That that is in in some sense true, but it doesn't uh, free us from the dependent of of the social environment. People would agree with that, but if you look to the individualism that Descartes sort of lays the foundation for, mm -hmm. and then add to that the industrial revolution mm -hmm. and the view of the body as a machine mm -hmm. serving a higher purpose, yeah. Yeah. The, the view of the individual becomes useful in a capitalist yeah, environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you have a world with individualism, capitalism, mm -hmm. uh, nation states, mm -hmm. uh, and this all works together. Yeah. And also, I think that there is an idea of the, how do you say it? Um, 
individuality means it's indivisible, yeah. I think. And, and so the, the individual is seen as a kind of a monad that has, has, has closed borders uh, to everybody else, including uh, all, all creation. But, but, the, but this is just one way of seeing embodiment. And I suggest that being embodied is actually the being in relation. So the body is not just the border towards everybody else, but it's also, it, it's, it's the border in the sense that it, it is actually the, the condition of possibility of being in relation to someone. So it's also inviting. I use a typology that I fetched from Michel Bakhtin on, on the, the classic body, which is have, have borders that, that shuts out everybody else. And, 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 uh, and the grotesque body, because the grotesque body is always, is always in relation, it's always open. And, and I think this is also politically significant, because I think the idea of a nation state is construed in, in very much the same way as an individual. The, the nation state, state is the body politic, uh, so to speak, of the nation state is seen as a giant individual. Yes. And that um, obviously in our times had some um, vile <laughs> effects on. Yeah. On. And especially when it's challenged, because then you have a Trump like effect. You need to build walls. So you, so you can see this both at an individual scale, but you can also look at a societal scale. Right. But just. To say something about bodies, you say at at some point in the book you mention uh, Augustine, is it who who says that I know what time is until someone asks me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's it's easy to sort of have an understanding, but then if someone asks me to explain what is time, it much it's much more difficult. I and feel then, that about almost everything. <laughs> <laughs> true, and and but it's it, it's very true. I think of the body. I I sometimes think that. Of course, my lungs are part of my body, and it helps me breathe. But the trees is also helping me breathe. Mm -hmm. So where do I draw the line between what is my body? And perhaps this cuts into the sort of individualistic, almost narcissistic yeah. uh, Cartesian understanding. And, and I think, you know, if you have a more social or environmentalistic or ecological understanding, about the body, it opens up and makes the body much more porous. Yeah. There's a complementary concept uh, which I haven't dealt with uh, at length in this book, which is um, speci spe speciality. Uh, I, I, I think this, this, this long book has many shortcomings, and one of them is that I don't talk about speciality and how embodiment means taking place uh, in a space uh, enough, uh, but maybe maybe I get to write another long book about that. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm just going to read a little quote here from the book. Uh, you write that the bodies of human beings and animals were conceived as mechanical marvels without intrinsic meaning, as a mechanic clockwork. Their meaning existed in the purpose that they were pro produced for the purpose of the people making it. Mm -hmm. So you have the idea of why do you have a clock? Mm -hmm. You need to make sure the workers are in time to at their workplace, so you invent clocks. Mm -hmm. And the same thing is true for the body, mm -hmm. uh, or the view of the body. Mm -hmm. uh, it's intrinsically meaningless. Mm -hmm. And so here, Nietzsche's critique is quite spot yeah. on. Yeah. It's nihilism yeah. uh, when it comes to, to the body. And true reality is elsewhere. Mm -hmm. It's not physical. Yeah. It's mental. I was thinking that one one of the the effects uh, or consequences of that is is the way we think of animals, uh, because they they are they are just bodies. It's, I mean, I don't think so, but but sometimes they are uh, construed as just bodies, just uh, just machines, and and this this has consequences on, on how we treat them. But I think one of the most exciting things that I've discovered, it's not in the book, but is, is how, how a different view of embodiment actually also means a different understanding of, of what it means to relate to animals. Yeah. Uh, and, and because, so, so the, the question, are, are the dog conscious or not, is, is not 
it, it's 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 much more difficult than than that. Uh, yeah. And and luckily there are people who do research on that, which is is it's very interesting. And of course, you know, Descartes' view of the animals were that they had no soul, so mm -hmm. they were only machines. Mm -hmm. We have still the ghost in the machine. Mm -hmm. The the cat doesn't. And so if right. you hurt a cat and the cat makes a noise, it's like the squeaking of a door. Yeah. yeah. And that's a consequence. And of course, you know, if you look to the, the, the industrialization yeah. of farm animals and so on, it's connected. Mm -hmm. To challenge this view is not only sort of an intellectual exercise, it has deeply ethical implications as well. Yeah. yeah. And, and Descartes describes also the body as a corpse. One of the reasons I think that the dead body became the paradigmatic body was that the dead body lies still. I mean, l life is always on its way somewhere. Uh, but but for for medicine, the modern medicine that grew uh, that grew under this time is it needed a body that lay still, so to speak. So and so the dead body became the paradigmatic body, maybe especially for. Um, for, for medicine. This is, this is the thesis of, of Foucault in The Birth of the Clinic. And I think that this view of the body as a machine, as a corpse, is, has also had a lot of impact on, on, on modern healthcare, um, which in some way has been helpful, but in some way hasn't. I mean, it's, it's definitely, there, there's been progress in medicine since the, uh, say, 12th or 13th century. For instance, anesthesia, which I, I would say is, is a good thing. Yes. You then move on. So let's, let's leave Descartes mm -hmm. to the side. But I think we've all sort of got the picture that his view of the body was quite useful for capitalist people. Not, you know, but everyone. I, I, but I, it, it's, 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 not, it's not this objectifying of the body. It's not just for capitalism. So the, it's not just a bad thing. No, no, I don't no. think so. But I do think that there is, you need to take into consideration why, why is it that Descartes' understanding becomes so uh, useful sure. and that it sticks, you know? Right. Why is right. this understanding yeah. the one that mm -hmm. sort of shapes modernity rather than some other? And I think you cannot take out of that equation the usefulness of the people in power. No, no, you, I think you're right. So you step into a new paradigm from mm -hmm. sort of feud feudalist view mm -hmm. to capitalism mm -hmm. and nation states mm -hmm. and even democracy. I mm -hmm. mean, there you have sort of both. You, you can critique capitalism, but you can also say, well, we've got democracy as well. So it's not sort of a moralistic mm -hmm. statement from my part. It's okay. just sort of an understanding of trying to understand why is it that this view becomes so important in yeah. Western history. Okay, so, but then you introduce, you make a leap to a French thinker, uh, Merleau-Ponty. Yeah. And you talk about the subject and the object and that distinction. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe you can explain why that is important. Oh, wow. Um, but Merleau-Ponty is, is, has written a lot of things on, on embodiment. He's written a book called Phenomenology of Perception. Uh, which is the one that actually plays the biggest role in, in my book. And he tries to overcome the sharp distinction between the subject and the object. So an objectifying view on embodiment would be um, the, the physical body or the biological body. That is an object. But he speaks about the lived body. And this is the body through which you relate and orient yourself in, um, in, 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 uh, in your environment. So, for instance, when, when, I, when I reach my hand for this cup of water that is in front of me, my bodily attention is in my arms, so to speak, whereas, whereas I don't think so much about that I'm actually sitting on a chair. So, so the, and the lived body is, is um, a much more, it's, it's a sort of the condition of possibility. It's the background of every embodied thing we do. And, and so it's, it's, um, it's, it's got abilities and potentialities in itself that aren't always realized. And it's, 
So, and it, it's, it's, I don't, I don't, in, the lived body is, is me, in a sense. It, I don't have uh, the body. It's, it's, it's actually what I am. Um, so you're critiquing Descartes now. I am. Well, Merleau-Ponty, yeah, I but... think, is critiquing. But but I agree with him. So, so fair enough. And so, and and this 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 understanding of the body is much. It's 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 implied in everything we do. I think. And and but it's it's not thematized. I think Merleau-Ponty says somewhere that that his. It, well, he moves then on to from from speaking of the body to speaking of the flesh flesh uh, when it gets even more complicated but but maybe we'll get to that maybe we don't um, but but he he says that this is this is something that hasn't been been thematized by any philosophy I don't think that is necessarily true but but, but it surely uh, in a lot of especially modern philosophy body is is something uh, it's an object it's it's a machine as you say it's and but the lived body is 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 always in is you couldn't have a you couldn't have a physical body if you don't have a lived body so to speak because the the physical body without the lived body is is just a corpse it's not a body in yes. a sense so the dualism in Descartes creates a problem for how to relate an idea to the body, the body to an idea. Mm -hmm. uh, how is it that Merleau-Ponty then talks about this in a way that, that doesn't create that problem? Maybe, maybe it was a long time since I read him, but I, I recently started to think whether, I mean, it's, I don't quite get how Merleau-Ponty understands subjectivity. Subjectivity would be my way of formulating a similar question, which is uh, even it's it, it's you 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 always have the ability to stand back uh, to to reflect on your body. I can even though I could without thinking reach for that cup of water. I can thematize. Uh, look at my oh here's my hand. Let's take my hand and grip this cup of water and move it towards my mouth. So there's always the possibility of reflexivity, and that's that's important because it makes us conscious of ourselves. And and uh, and I, I I don't quite remember how a melodonty works. But I think with, with with your way of thinking, at least from what you've been saying now, and something that I think I read in the book, um, is that there are processes of subjectification. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's mm. that's from Guattari, but there is there is in in Foucault something similar. Yeah, uh, he doesn't say techniques of subjectification, maybe. I yeah yeah. So what is that? What 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 does it, what what is a, a process or a technique of subjectification? How do we become aware of ourselves in our bodies? Uh, well, the different techniques of subjectivity. Let me take one example, uh, which is not fetched from Foucault, but which is what I'm dealing with now. And I think it's the it's it's the relation between pain and and suffering. Pain, I think, is 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 a physical something you feel in your body. You if, if you go to the dentist, there will be pain. Uh, eventually. Not for me. I don't have cavities. No. Uh, well, for me, there will be. He's the only uh, one telling me. I'm <laughs> <laughs> but but there, there there could be pain involved. Uh, but but the the, the suffer, suffering is is not is is, is e don't, doesn't equal pain. Suffering is a way of relating to pain. It's it's undergoing pain. It's it's it's. Um, it's enduring pain uh, at the dentist, and it, th that's a technique of subjectification. Yeah. I and think, it's, and it, I would say it's also you know if you feel pain but you know it will go away yeah. in five seconds, right? It will be much different than having pain and not knowing if it will ever go away. <laughs> so suffering right. enters in in right. that process. But, but this this means that you you relate to something that is going on in yourself, yeah. and I think there's there's another book I refer to um, in 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 this big book of mine, which is by um, 
by Drew Ledden, who's, who's a medical doctor but, but also a philosopher. And he speaks, he uses the concept of the absent body. And, and there are a lot of absences in, in the body. But, but he says that the mind, the mind body dualism of Descartes has its phenomenological counterpart in, in the way that you can actually consciously relate to yourself as an embodied creature which is a, a very strange thing. I think this is what Merleau-Ponty calls flesh also, because the flesh is the medium where you can relate to yourself as embodied. Uh, if there's this famous example by Merleau-Ponty where he says that if you touch your hand, uh, is, is, it, is it the right hand that is touching the left hand, or is it the left hand that is touching uh, the right hand. There's a re reversibility here, uh, w w which you could become consciously aware of, and and this introduces a distinction, uh, w which means that when that to be embodied is is not a, to be a machine. It doesn't mean that there are no distinction in in yourself. It doesn't mean for Meloponti that you can't talk about the soul, although the soul is not another uh, another entity i mean somehow outside or inside your body is located somewhere um, but but it, it's it's this ability to relate to yourself as embodied not 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 i mean while you're still embodied so to speak i think one one, one of the implications of descartes philosophy was that man is free to act as a first cause. Yeah. This is something that we talked about yesterday with Spinoza's critique of Descartes mm -hmm. uh, and how ultimately we cannot really think that I caused everything to mm -hmm. happen and so we posit sort mm -hmm. of deus ex machina God mm -hmm. to make our worldview complete. Mm -hmm. We talked about this yesterday. Uh, but with the, the understanding of the body that you talk about more as your own understanding, mm -hmm. where there are these passions and pains, mm -hmm. and there are forces moving us, and there's also, the, of course, the genetic component mm -hmm. to the body. Nietzsche says then that it's sort of incomprehensible to even explain what free will would mean. Mm -hmm. And so maybe you can say something about this understanding of, of the body and our, the processes of subjectification that we're going through where we become aware of our own body and how we then can act as subjects. Let me put it like this perhaps. Um, as your Gadamer, the, the German philosopher, has, has a definition of health, uh, which is interesting because he says that health is, is what you have when you don't think about whether you're healthy or not, because you're so busy doing other things. And, but, but the moment you lose your health, then you start to think about health. And, and uh, this is a neat description of, of uh, how I think subjectivity comes about. Uh, not, not, not that you cannot think that, oh wow, I'm feeling great at the moment, I'm out running and everything feels fine. It's, 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 but, but usually uh, something, that when, when, you're, when you're disturbed, when, you're, when your homeostasis stasis is disturbed somehow, then, then, then you, get, you, you start to relate to yourself in a way that, that gives rise to subjectivity. And also, of course, um, experience, experience of, of being overwhelmed by, by something in some way outside of yourself, like another human being, or um, um, a beautiful painting, or, or God, or, or, or whatever. I mean, this, this is also the birth of subjectivity, uh, not, not, not as a first cause, but as something that is, is potentially always in your abilities but not always realized you know we have for example a legal system which is based on 
a modernistic understanding about subjectivity. Mm -hmm. Your mind is supposed to control the passions. Right. And if you fail at doing that, mm -hmm. it will lock you up. Mm -hmm. And so if the understanding of the body and the relationship to subjectivity changes, mm -hmm. uh, what happens, for example, with the legal system? Because, of course, you know, you can have a conversation about kids throwing rocks at the police, mm -hmm. something which happens quite frequently in Sweden. Mm -hmm. But you will also have people sort of defending that, saying, of course, you know, they grow up in these neighborhoods and it's not their own fault. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there, there is another understanding of the body right. that they're not responsible for their right. actions. I think, you know, we're going through a shift in our understanding of the body will also pose some serious questions to how we relate to, for example, the legal system. Right, and, and what does responsibility mean? Yeah. Because I, I can't see that my way of thinking about embodiment necessarily denies that we do, in some sense, have responsibilities. Yeah. I, I'm not after denying um, uh, autonomy uh -huh. in, in some sense, but it needs to be construed differently if, if you understand the body and on your and sociality in this way. And something that, that you bring up is, I don't know what you call him, maybe the Archbishop of Feminism, uh, Judith Butler. Ah, I do. That was your expression. <laughs> no, <mine. laughs> I think it's a good expression, uh, but it's mine. Okay, so but you bring up her. She critiques Merleau-Ponty. Yeah, but um, I think I think she is, is, is I, I think she does it in, in a She's in conversation with Merleau-Ponty. Yeah. I think she's dependent in some ways on Merleau-Ponty and a host of other thinkers as well. But that, if I remember correctly, her her critique is that he didn't really take notice of how dependent on social institutions of embodiment we actually are. He, he, it's in, and especially in phenomenology or perception, he is. Um, um, he construes a kind of a temple, a historic idea of the body, anyhow. And uh, whereas embodiment is is sort of dependent on on social institutions, which has consequences for the the gender body. For yeah, so instance. he universalizes the male right, body. Right. Right. So she has this idea of of the body's history as it's it's a sedimented history, so to speak. We're, we, we sort of come from somewhere and we are going somewhere. Um, and and I, I think that's a reasonable critique, uh, but I don't think she is um, anti melopathy no. But maybe we can talk about her understanding of the body as well as performative. Right. Yes, uh, we can. Uh, <laughs> Do you have something to say about it? <laughs> he, I, I think... She, uh, um, this was actually a long time I read, but I think I, I mean, it, the body is is the 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 body is a performance. It, it, she was she was accused. She wrote a book called um, what was it called? The first book, Gender Trouble. Right, Gender Trouble, where she was accused of having a voluntaristic idea <coughs> on the embodiment that we could somehow, in an individualistic sense, choose how we. we Perceive our bodies, and and so the concept of the body became eph ephemeral in the sense that it was it was it was nothing material about the body. But but she denied that in in bodies that matter. Uh, I think I think she's right. It wasn't her idea. But the the idea is that the the body is not the body is not something given. We don't. In in, this, in, a, in one sense, of course, we, we are bodies, but what that means is not something given. And that's that's um that that's a critique of every a historical idea of the body, but it's also a critique of of the image of the body in in contemporary or in any society as as something given, and and so for instance. The differences between uh, between the sexes and, and genders are not something given by nature or by God, so to speak, but something that are 
historically construed, but that doesn't mean that you and I go away and, and construe another body, because in that sense, it's a given. We, it's, we are thrown into an, an understanding of the body that we have to work through and, and doesn't, just can't dismiss. Yeah, there's a Heideggerian element to her understanding. Yeah, that. it's a Heideggerian, I think also it's a Hegelian, yeah. but, 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 but uh, that means that, that not, so the difference between the sexes are not something given for forever. Uh, uh, it's, it's fluid, but not in some voluntaristic sense, but, but in the long run. You know, we create the environment, and the environment returns the favor, right, creates yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. And so, if we've created, in her understanding, a very patriarchal society, mm. that will have an effect on how we, how, on our bodies, of mm -hmm. course, and our understanding of our bodies, and how we treat each other, and mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. But we need to move on. It's a big book. <laughs> so <laughs> I have a few things that I, I want to talk about more. You know, we said you wrote this book. I don't know if I said it, but you wrote it 10 years ago. It's right. in Swedish. Mm -hmm. And it's now being published in English. Hence, we're doing this podcast to market Ula in America. So it becomes famous. famous. <laughs> it's like the, the Swedish Sijek. Oh, just well, needs uh, uh, well, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there is a small section in this book that I thought when I read it that if you had written the book this year, mm -hmm. perhaps that section would have been a little bit bigger. And that is on the technological body. Because we're uh -huh. doing yeah. great advances all the uh -huh. time on the technological body. Right. What is the technological body? And uh, you want to have, use one example that everyone can relate to. Mm -hmm. The iPhone or the smartphone. Yes. Uh, and talk about the iPhone from the view of a technological body. Oh, wow. Um, if I can say something about technology first, I, what, I, what I say in this very short section is that technology, technology we, 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 the body has almost always, or perhaps not almost always, but always drawn technology into it. So it is, in a certain sense, a part of our bodies. So for, I wear glasses, for instance, and the glasses are a part of my body, uh, in the sense of the lived body. Of course I can take them off, but, but they, they, they become a part of me because they help me do things like, like, like reading, for instance. And without them, I would be quite lost, at least when it comes to reading. And, and so they're, they're not something extrinsic to my embodiment. You have a good uh, example in the book uh, of a liberation theology of disability. Right. Where the lady, I don't remember her name, talks about the wheels of her wheelchair yes. as part of her body. Mm. My body is not just mm. flesh and bones, it's also my wheels. Right. So, so technology that we construe ourselves is not necessarily an, an sort of addition to our, our body. It, some, something, but they change our way of being embodied, of course, because, I mean, for instance, I can, I can read uh, since I have glasses, and, and the person who's blind but have a stick can, can feel his or her way through, through a room or or, or go out walking, so to speak. And so, so in that sense, technology can enhance our possibilities. The iPhone, of course, enhances, enhances our possibilities, as do other, other technology. And, and maybe there are some technology that would, would change our way of being in the world in a more radical way than wearing glasses, for instance. Yeah. So I'm sure there is, and and so the iPhone might be one of them for for good and bad, of course. Of course, and and the thing is, I think technology always sort of enhances our desires. Yes, and, and it yes. sort of reveals to us what is our desires, mm -hmm. because you you have you know the Heideggerian example of how we relate to objects. Right. What is what is this cup? It's something that I can drink water mm -hmm. out, out of, but it's also something that I can hurt someone mm -hmm. with, and so the technology reveals my intentions, my desires. Right, right. The iPhone, I think, you know, thinking about the internet and, mm -hmm. and the technology of the iPhone, which soon, soon will be in our glasses, mm -hmm. um, 
I think it sort of localizes the body. It does. But decentralizes it our understanding of ourselves and also perhaps the individual becomes pluralized it, because it, we have the possibility it, of being different avatars in different places on it, the internet. It and could, so but I'm not so, so sure whether, I mean some, there's always this horizon of endless possibilities uh, in, in technology when the internet came up it was it was there would be peace and prosperity all over the world that ha that hasn't really materialized yet um, some of you probably listened to the podcast with Chester Bruin from London mm -hmm. he's written a book about this which is called getting high mm -hmm. and it's about the human desire for ascension mm -hmm. that the moon landing projects LSD the Pentecostal movement uh, digital culture and so on has all been attempts to escape the world mm -hmm. and nothing has succeeded. People thought if we go to the moon and we see the world, our world, mm -hmm. from there, of course no one want, will want to go to war anymore. Yeah. So, and, and the same thing with LSD. If everyone right. just takes LSD, have right. that experience, we will not have war anymore. Yeah. But it hasn't worked. No. Well, we don't know that for sure. Because everyone hasn't done LSD. No, no. Maybe we should. <laughs> oh, maybe not. <laughs> I think I'm. I'm not. I'm not at at all uh, a skeptic of technology, but I'm a skeptic of these endless possibilities that technology supposedly are going to give us, and I'm also skeptic against the very easy idea of this. I'm this going to change everything, and and maybe some things will do, maybe. But, yeah. and, and maybe we don't want that, but maybe they will do that anyhow. But I'm not so sure uh, whether this will actually happen. And, and secondly, also, you mentioned the iPhone. The iPhone is not for everyone. Uh, the, the internet is not free. Uh, you, you need a credit card to get out on yeah. the internet. You need a computer. So, so it's, not, it's not that easy. So. Um, uh, I, I don't know enough about this to say something very profound, but I'm, I'm sometimes skeptic, and I think this is what I say in, in this short section about the claims of, of, of how this is going to change everything. Yeah. I think, you know, the social body, uh, of course, is affected by this, though, mm -hmm. because in the past, perhaps you could live in your village, and there was not that much information around. Mm -hmm. And you got the information usually perhaps from the priest mm -hmm. and then from the professor. Mm -hmm. And we're moving into an era at least where, for example, fake news becomes something we talk right. about. What is truth? Suddenly mm -hmm. there's epistemological conversations, quite uninformed ones, but still <coughs> on newscasts, mm -hmm. uh, where old authorities are claiming that you should have listened to this new mm -hmm. information. And I think, you know, regardless of the quality of that information, um, you think of a community like a church, a body mm -hmm. like a church. Before it was qu quite closed off, like the individual. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, people are listening to us, not just in this room, mm -hmm. but people are listening mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. online. And this conversation reaches into rooms and bodies where it would never have entered even just 10 years ago. Right, you are absolutely, but, but, but nevertheless, I don't think that all these institutions before internet were closed off. No. Because, I mean, for, for instance, uh, I don't know why this came up in my mind, but uh, the, the Swedish 19th century thinker Yale uh, was in conversation with all of Europe and this was, uh, and and he he had subscriptions on on I think German and English and French newspapers who came to him quite rapidly in Uppsala where he lived. So he was actually in conversation with. Uh, he had he had access to information, but what he did have was not only information because you can have all the information that you want or or need in your iPhone, sure, but. But information is not enough because you need some kind of judgment to process that. Yeah. And I think the how do we achieve such judgment? And I think that's an entirely different matter than, than having access to information. 
I, I, I work at a university where we have lectures, we have seminars, and and in a in a in a way in the much the same um, way that has been going on since, say, the 12th or 13th century. Uh, and this, that is for a good reason, because this is a way, I mean, in the best of all worlds, of, of developing your judgment. Not, not, and so the, to be a professor to, or to be a student is, is a way of training your judgment. It's not about getting information, but it's, it's being formed in a way that so you can be an authentic judge of what information is trustworthy and what is not. Yeah, if you're good at that, you become an authority figure in our world because mm -hmm. there is so much information. So mm -hmm. being one of those people who gathers much information and then distributes it makes you powerful in this world in a yep. way that perhaps money did in the capitalist system. Sure, but system. I think there were, if you become a famous academic, uh, where it doesn't, it's another, it's something different than the academic work that is going on in, in local yeah. universities. I I'm, 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 I would be happy if I were remembered as somebody who did a good job in theology at the University of Gothenburg. Sure but 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 I'm not necessarily. I don't want. Not, not, not that I think that this is an option, but I would not want to be someone who tours the world and, and, yeah. and gives lectures just for show. Uh, and I think there are some philosophers that are doing that now. It doesn't, it's not always helpful, yeah. even though they are interesting philosophers. Yeah, I enjoy C. Shakespeare. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's the perfect example. Yeah. I think the last thing I want to say about the internet and that type of, 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 of shift we're going through, um, I think there has been, as you say, people have been reading German newspapers and so on. Something that has shifted is that information had a much more top-down movement in the past. Today, information moves in all directions at the oh, same yeah, time. Yeah. I think it's the... Uh, Availability, the access to information, is a good thing. I'm, 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 I'm so happy that that there are so many books on the internet. So, which means that when I go away, I don't need an extra bag for my books because because I can have the, all of them, all of them, and on my computer. That's yeah. that's very helpful uh, yeah. in a very in a direct physical sense. But also, in, I mean, in your world, in the university, mm -hmm. um, I mean, this is also a democratization. Of knowledge because suddenly there are millions of people who in the past would not have access to great education right. who can now study online mm -hmm. and so it's going to be a challenge I think for smaller universities absolutely uh, the greater universities they are putting a lot of money into this so that rather than going to your local Högskola or whatever yep. in Sweden you might study at Harvard yeah, but that would be online. Yes. That's that's I I'm not against online education, but I think speaking of the body, I think there is a sense that what what to to learn is is not an online experience in the sense that when I am teaching in a classroom or conduct a seminar or or whatever, this is this is an experience which is not just about what I'm saying, but it's actually about physical presence. So the body not, becomes important. Then. The body becomes important. So, so this that's, that's again why I'm quite skeptic about the radicality of, of all these things. I'm sure people would want to say that. Oh, I have an education at Harvard, <laughs> uh, but but is it? Is it really as good as an education at Högskolan and Borås? Uh, <laughs> Maybe give, not. Give, given that you actually get to meet, but the, but maybe if you live in some small village in India, sure, there is yeah. even there is no Högskola uh, in Borås. <laughs> in Borås, <laughs> yeah, you're <right> from. <laughs> um, so before I, I want to open up, so if you guys have questions, start to think about it, and we'll we'll open up for you to ask Ola. But before we do that, I want to talk about the the liturgical body, right? Uh, because, as you said, and maybe I said as well, that you say that Nietzsche's critique is sweeping of the mm -hmm. church, 
And now we look through some of the main ideas in mm -hmm. Western philosophical history yes. when it comes to our understanding of the body. So maybe you can say something about the Christian understanding of the body and to perhaps be more nuanced than Nietzsche was in oh, his critique. How many minutes? Uh, you can talk for five minutes. <laughs> now, I, I think, uh, as, as you said, we, we've discussed the, mostly the philosophical yeah. body or the embodiedness to philosophy. I think uh, I, I, w w one of the things I do uh, in the book is uh, trying to reread the history of Christianity or Christian theology to embodiedness. I mean, it's, it's a very, even though it's a big book, it's, it's a short way of putting it. And I think I, I try to, to look at different, <coughs> different practices in the Christian church that actually always are embodied. And liturgy, for one thing, is, is, a, is a way of, of um, forming embodiment. So th th this is not an argument for a particular kind of liturgy. It's just saying that liturgy is a, a, a social embodied performance that, that do form in some ways how we relate to each other in an embodied way. I find that through writing this book, I'm, I'm very, the, the, the church as a community, as an institution, is, is very important to me. Not, not necessarily a particular, I mean, of course, my own church is, is, is particularly important to me, but I'm not suggesting a particular church, but I think this dimension of, of, of being Christian as is important because that's how, in a sense, you learn to relate. So, in it, and so my my own tradition, which is the Lutheran tradition, Church of Sweden, has been very. It, it's been centered around the word, and of course, the word is still immensely important. And, and and I say that as someone who, I mean, who reads and talks all the time, we shouldn't forget that it's also taking place somewhere in, in, a, in a building or outside of a building and, and the building that is construed in some ways and we have a liturgy that, that teaches us how to, to move, to, to stand up, to sit down, to, to turn in the different directions and so on. And, and, and so the liturgy, but also of course prayer and, and, and all kinds of practices are, are embodied practices through which we learn what it means to be an embodied person. And I think in a, in a, in a tradition centered around the word, all these aesthetic, so to speak, uh, dimensions of Christianity are easily forgotten. So, so the, 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 uh, the aesthetic. I, I don't mean that in a, in a in a narrow sense. I mean it in a broad sense as as perception. The, the our perceptions, our embodied perceptions, are as important to us as as is the embodied perception of just listening. Yeah, and it's also. I mean the the, the liturgy as a process of subject. Right. Absolutely. And so yes. Also, so we create these practices and the aesthetics, you yeah. know, the architecture, mm -hmm. and as I said with Judith Butler before, we yeah. create the world and the world creates us. Right. And so we we create these processes. Yeah. Because we believe that they do something mm -hmm. with our understanding about ourselves and yeah. our understanding about community. Mm -hmm. But you also talk about uh, salvation history. Mm -hmm. uh, and how that relates to the body, because of course, in the Christian tradition, which should make you suspicious of Nietzsche's critique, uh, we have the notion of the word becoming flesh. Right, right. Um, and if if you take Nietzsche's critique seriously and you think, yeah, I can see this, perhaps especially if we read the Christian hith history through the eyes of Descartes' mm -hmm. dualism, and that creates this this chasm mm -hmm. um, between the spirits and the body. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the Christian history, you still have this notion that the Logos became flesh. Right. 
uh, yeah, well, if there's a, a huge part of the book is about the incarnation, yeah. uh, uh, how God, in some way, became a human being in Christ, and th and and th this is a lot of, this is as you say, a lot about flesh, and yeah. and of course, I mean that that doctrine has been forgotten in some ways, but but what I try to do in the book is ex to explicate what it. Could actually mean uh, if, if we take it seriously that, that the word became flesh. Please explain. Well, that, I think this is what we've been doing uh, yeah. this this hour. It's it's that 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 the that the word became in, as in, uh, uh, to just put it in a short way it, it, that the word became flesh doesn't mean just that the word became many more words as one can critique contemporary Christianity of, but that it actually takes place in in practices uh, uh, as much as in words. And, and so it, and it also means something for the understanding of the body. I think, I think the, this Christianity and this doctrine meant in late antiquity a change in, in the understanding of suffering, for instance. Suffering as something actually belonging to human existence and not not just something that is extrinsic, and that meant, in in some way, a, a change in the understanding of the body, uh, uh, and so the doctrine of incarnation has been hugely important uh, through uh, Western history, and and a lot of Western philosophy, for instance, would not be thinkable without. Um, without the incarnation. Of, I mean, Merleau-Ponty is, I would suggest, very obviously an incarnational thinker. He's, he's, he's not a Christian, and I don't want to theologize him. It's, that's, it's not that. It's just that he comes out of the, the, the reception history of the incarnation. And the other obvious candidate would be Hegel, of course. Uh, w w who wouldn't be thinkable without yeah. But someone like Catherine Malibu, who's writing something <laughs> that could be described as an incarnational theology, she finds in Hegel a way of sort of disrupting the classical understanding of he Hegelian dialectics, right. and that opens up for what could be described as a sort of secular incarnational theology. Yeah, I mean, she's definitely on, on, the, on the secular side of yes. that incarnational theology, but what she's doing is that she is... She is uh, I think the theological dimensions of, of Hegel's thinking has been seriously neglected in a lot of Hegel research uh, lately. And, and so Catherine Malibu and, and Slavoj Žižek has done a lot of good things because what they did is, is they tried to uh, overcome the distinction between, between left-wing Hegelianism and, and right-wing Hegelianism from a left-wing Hegelianism side, which means that they're on the side of the secular, but but to still show how important the theological dimension was for Hegel and, and actually still is for their own thinking, even though it's not theological in in a Christian sense. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, even someone like Zizek, he says, I'm an atheist, but I'm a Christian yeah, yeah. atheist. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, it's, it's, it's um, uh, well, it's, it's, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't find myself on on Shishik's side and I'm a Christian but I'm not an atheist and so I don't think necessarily atheism is the sort of dialectical uh, uh, goal of, of, of Christianity which Shishik actually says I think that's supersessionist to say so but 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 nevertheless uh, uh, this uh, and it has a lot of things to do with the body and how, how we see historical development as well. So, yeah. and, and I would say also essences. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we think about who we are, who, because this understanding that I'm born to something, there's a plasticity here to our understanding about ourselves, mm -hmm. of our subjectivity, mm -hmm. uh, that I think we should also not only think you know, at a personal level, but as a, as a social level. Mm -hmm. um, the body of Christ as being plastic as well. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. in, in Malibu, you have this sort of explosive element to that, mm -hmm. where there's, there's disruptions right. uh, that, that can lead to change. And, right, yeah. You know, sometimes 
maybe not from Malibu, but from a Deleuzean theological perspective, mm -hmm. I sometimes refer to Jesus' notion uh, of uh, the wineskins mm -hmm. as old wineskins. Yeah. If you pour new wine into them, they mm -hmm. crack, so you need to mm -hmm. have plastic mm -hmm. wineskins or right. flexible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because I think one of the risks is that we confuse our sort of conceptual understanding of the world for the world itself and that we lock ourselves in inside these concepts mm -hmm. and and i think that becomes oppressive mm -hmm. if, yeah, if, yeah. if if we yeah. uh, if we could make that confusion and we're back in plato's distinction yeah and we're still talking about him so maybe it's just footnotes plato Yes, yes, maybe there is, and maybe, maybe, maybe it's a good thing too. Yeah. So, last thing, you, you mentioned the grotesque body. Right. And in the Christian tradition, of course, you have a grotesque body hanging on a cross. Right. The grotesque body, I get that from Bakhtin. Uh, I think it's a, it's, this, this is the distinction being a, between a closed and an open body, the classic body and the, the grotesque body. But, of course, it it's also draws upon... On, on the crucifixion of of of, of Jesus, uh, which is supposedly in the Christian tradition, where where God opens up and invites everybody to become become part of the body of Christ, and and so the crucified and broken body of Christ is distributed uh, through through this crucifixion and and through the resurrection, and 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 this 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 this, this is a wildly different understanding of embodiment than than the uh, so common sense understanding of the body as as biology uh, because it actually means sharing in each other's bodies not i think dissolving all, all the distinctions between you and me uh, but because that would be something else it's Gillian rose who, who wrote a soul without borders is as crazy as um, as a soul that borders are, are, are shut. So it's 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 a way of understanding relationality, but also through through the through the medium of the broken body, and and so that's also a, I think it could be used as a critical concept in in critiquing. Um, for instance, the, how the body is portrayed in, in advertising. These are usually 20-year-old bodies, male or female, that are perfect. They are made perfect probably through, through Photoshop. So, so they're very smooth. They're very smooth. Uh, and, and, and so the, I, the body ideal of our age is, is I think, quite oppressive. Because it's it's always a twenty year old body uh, that that is sort of lifted up as the perfect body, and all of our bodies are broken or will be broken, uh, and 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 so this is also a political concept in that sense that we need other images of what it means to be embodied. Thank you for listening to this episode that was it for Ola this time his new book heavenly bodies incarnation the gaze and embodiment in christian theology is out and let me just tell you that this was the first part of a real successful day where we listened to a number of interesting thinkers and i'm just very happy to say that catacomb 17 was a great success i hope that we'll pull one off next year as well next episode will not be as far away as the next catacomb event i think that i'll put it out maybe tomorrow or the day after it's with alexander bard swedish internet sociologist cyber philosopher he's written a number of books with jan sedifist and we have a real interesting conversation and if you want to prepare for that talk you can go back and listen to when alexander was last on the podcast and we talked about his then newly published book synthism which was the fourth book that Jan and Alexander wrote together. The first three are the Futurica Trilogy. If you want to support this project, go to patreon.com slash the catacombic machine and keep this show going. Thank you for listening. We'll talk soon. Bye.